Salutations to the Truth Corps, whoever and wherever you may be on the planet. I'm back again with a short talk that might be considered, short I hope, I wish, that might be considered as a footnote to a previous talk I uploaded on the significance of the 2020 Jupiter-Saturn conjunction for the future of humanity. So now let me tell you a little bit about the past of humanity, not the future, but the past. And in particular, I'm focusing on a precise moment in the past, December in the year 6 BC, December 26th, to be precise, in the year 6 BC. With this talk, I provided an illustration of a section of the sky on that date. And the title of this talk is The Mission of the Magi, or Magi. Now, what I attempted to do in the other talk about Jupiter-Saturn conjunctions is describe the big picture, the long-term framework. And I explained that even though these conjunctions do happen every 20 years chronologically, the sequences to follow happen every 60 years. So there are three laps of the race between Jupiter and Saturn every 60 years. And at these 60 year intervals, Jupiter and Saturn appear in conjunction at certain points in the sky, which define a great triangle that is called the trigon of the great conjunctions of Jupiter and Saturn. Now I've tracked these events, which are actual astronomical events, for <laughs> quite a while. And if you might venture to ask me, how far have I tracked them? I'm guessing that I probably tracked them back to around 500 BC. So I've looked at the pattern of these conjunctions over time, across history, in the sky, for about 2,500 years. And I've compiled charts, diagrams, lists, chronological tables, which correlate the sequence of the 60 year cycles with historical events that occurred simultaneously with those conjunctions, just as historical events and social events are occurring today simultaneously with the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction. Now, to begin, I would like to state a caveat, a warning. I do not and have never considered or observed the theory that planetary events such as this influence human affairs. I take a different view. I consider these conjunctions and other events in the panorama of the night sky over many centuries of time, I consider them to be signals rather than causes. You see, I have learned in my life, throughout my life, that the events that occur in the sky can be viewed by reference to a biofeedback device. So if you're hooked up to a biofeedback device and you practice some meditation or some act of concentration to calm yourself down or to lower your blood pressure, 
and this is a very effective technique, by the way, well, you will find that the readout on the monitor of the biofeedback device will show that your blood pressure goes down. But it would be absurd to assume that the signal on the machine is causing your blood pressure to go down, wouldn't it? The biofeedback machine is simply a monitor of your autonomous activity. Likewise, these signals and omens in the sky are simply monitoring signals, feedback signals that reflect what is happening in the divine experiment on Earth. They reflect the great trends in history, the great movements in human society, the life of the collective. The collective of the human species is like an animal, and that animal is connected to the immense biofeedback machine of the sky. So each omen in the sky is simply a signal of what is happening or due to happen in the collective life of humanity. It does not cause anything to happen. I also applied that rule in my 30 or 35 years as a practicing astrologer. I always told my clients in the first conversation that I am not going to talk about the planets in their chart as if the planets were influencing or causing them to behave. I'm simply reading the planets to develop a psychological profile of behavior. Enough said on that issue. I do consider it to be an extremely important point, however, and I advise you to reflect on it closely. So today I invite you to look back at a particular moment in the past. Now this moment has been commemorated in stories that come down to the world about something called the Star of Bethlehem. What actually was the Star of Bethlehem considered as a detectable astronomical event? What was it? Well, I've probably read about 10 books on this subject, and there are numerous theories about what the star of Bethlehem actually was, how it actually appeared in the sky. Now, there's a tradition in European astrology which uses the Latin word stellium, from the word stella, meaning star. And a stellium can mean, yes, the appearance of a star in the sky, but more specifically, it means a cluster of lights a striking appearance of lights that might be regarded as a star, but in fact, a stellium can be a conjunction of planets. So what the world saw at the end of December 2020, those who observe the sky just after sunset looking southwest, saw the striking sight of Jupiter and Saturn very close together, and that's a stellium even though Jupiter and Saturn are not stars. Now, there was a stellium in 6 BC, and it involved Jupiter and Saturn. So what I have done is trace back along the sequence of the 60-year cycles one particular point of the great trigon are you with me? That goes all the way back to this specific occurrence of a Jupiter-Saturn conjunction. And that has been identified, I believe, most accurately as corresponding to the so-called Star of Bethlehem. For instance, I have a book here from my library and archives titled The Star of Bethlehem. An Astronomer's Confirmation, written by David Hughes and published in 1979. So in my opinion, the conclusion that the author reaches in this book, namely that the Star of Bethlehem refers 
to a conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn in 6 BC is correct. And it is the singular best explanation of that event. The illustration I provided for this talk is a screenshot from stellarium.org and it shows some constellations and it shows exactly the position of Jupiter and Saturn and the moon in those constellations at around nine in the evening on the 26th of December, 6 BC. The fact that the moon is included at that moment, that the moon is in conjunction with the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction, adds to the dramatic power of this stellium. So you see even the moon, which is the planet or satellite of the Earth, not a planet, can be involved in a stellium, which does not necessarily refer to stars, it refers to any congregation of bright lights in the sky. Fine, so far so good. 10 minutes into it, can you imagine? It's taken me 10 minutes just to set up what I'm going to tell you. Now, as you look at the illustration, you'll see the constellation of the fishes, which I also call the constellation of the whales. And you see that one of the fishes is positioned at right angles to the other. So the fishes do not swim in opposite directions. That is a mistaken trope of astrology. And then off to the left, you see a kind of monster that is Cetus. And off to the right of the upper fish, you see a woman with her arms stretched out. And that is the constellation of Andromeda. And then below her, you see a part of the constellation of the winged horse, Pegasus. Now, I myself have drawn these constellations hundreds of times, and I have my own versions, which are somewhat different from those depicted here. Nevertheless, my rendering of those constellations, the whales, Cetus, the sea monster, Andromeda, and Pegasus, conforms exactly to the star patterns on which they are based. I'm talking here about the real sky. I'm not talking about astrology. The constellation of the fishes or whales is not to be equated with Pisces, the astrological sign. They are two distinct formats. In my astrological career, I used both of these formats concurrently. Doing so, I placed myself in an extremely small category. In fact, I really don't know of any other astrologers who use both the signs and the constellations. And most astrologers don't even know what the constellations are. So anyway, what about this moment and the Star of Bethlehem? Well, the Star of Bethlehem is a trope that comes out of an anecdote that comes out of the New Testament. And if you follow that anecdote, it says that the Star of Bethlehem was an event in the sky observed by the Magi, who were pagan astronomers and astrologers, and they recognized that it announced the birth of the Messiah. Have you heard that story before? That is total shite. The story of the birth of the Messiah recorded in the New Testament is nothing but a Jewish fairy tale. Unfortunately, large part of the world and countless millions of people in the world have adopted this fairy tale as part of their spiritual heritage. It's total fabrication. In fact, there are no genuine messiahs. There never have been and there never will be. Every messiah or every 
actor on the world stage who has been announced as a messiah is a fraud. The very concept of a messiah is fraudulent and it comes out of an alien mindset. If you subscribe to that story, then you, in fact, take on the belief that someone is going to come and save you and save the world. And this notion of the promise of the coming Messiah is one of the most destructive concepts or themes that has ever been inflicted upon the human species. And I hate it. And I have refuted it many, many times. The word Messiah is a variant of the Hebrew word, a Hebrew word, which means the anointed, you see? So the word Christos in Greek is a direct transposition of the Hebrew word for Messiah. So Christos is not the name of a person, it's the title of the anointed. And that title, of course, is attributed or applied to the Christian Savior, who is just another Messiah figure, just another spiritual fraud. While I'm on this subject, I can't resist to point something out. Let's see if I can do it in two minutes. In order to have the anointed Christos, Messiah, Savior, what do you need? Well, you need some agency who does the anointing. Can you see that? You cannot have the anointed one, Christos, without someone who anoints the Christos. So who anoints the Christos? Well, you find the answer to that question in the Jewish fairy tale recorded in the Old Testament and continued in the New Testament. And the name of the one who anoints is Melchizedek. Melchizedek is the supreme iconic figure who stands behind Christ. Even the Apostle Paul says so in the New Testament. Melchizedek is the power behind Christ. Melchizedek is the one who anoints. Melchizedek, as you may know, is the guardian angel of a certain shithole country in the Middle East. The guardian angel of uh, a country located at the lowest spot on earth. And how fitting is that? since it happens to be the habitation of something like parasitic scum that infects the divine experiment on this planet. Now, I wonder how the YT sensors will react to that comment if they pick it up. So now let me get to the fucking point before you all fall into a coma. I'm saying that the story of the star of Bethlehem, which announces the birth of the Messiah, is a deceitful fabrication. So if that is not the true story of this astronomical event, then what is the true story? Well, it's my pleasure and privilege to tell you that it is a story about something that happened to the leaders and founders of the mystery schools who have been called Gnostics and may also be called the Magi or the Magians. The deep root of the foundation of the mysteries and the Gnostic movement was the Magian order. I've written a lot about this fact over the past 15 years. So the Magians, among whom were the Sabaeans, were skilled sky watchers, and they could div divine these omens in the sky. 
So they observed the cycles of Jupiter and Saturn, just as I observe them today. And in fact, I use the same technique of observation, which is called celestial montique, that they used. Montique is the Greek word for divination. They were sky diviners, as I myself am to this very day. And so they read this omen in a particular way. They saw it as a signal, not a cause, but a signal for what? Well, to them, at that time, in 6 BC, it was a tremendously significant signal. Note that the conjunction is placed at the tail of the diving fish or the diving whale. You can imagine one of those fishes as diving or sounding into the depths as whales do, and the other fish to the left as leaping up out of the depths, as whales also do. What is the precise location of that conjunction? It's at the tail of the western whale, where it is connected by a thread, you see that thread or cord, to the tail of the eastern or leaping whale. Now, all these details can be translated into meaningful language. All these details belong to the genre of sidereal mythology, that is the mythology that is connected with actual constellations in the sky. And from that genre, if you study it in depth, you learn that each of the constellations is a repository of certain themes. And when you know those themes, then you interpret the events that happen in the constellations according to those themes. Easy enough, isn't it? So the Magi knew, the Magians knew, as I do today, that the constellation of the fishes is connected with the theme of the guidance of humanity, the guidance of the masses. And they faced a challenge at that moment in regard to how they would implement a program to guide the masses. The Machian order, which is the root of the Gnostics, had a special commitment. They carried through centuries a narrative. I call it the fallen goddess scenario or the Sophianic narrative. And they knew that this particular narrative has supreme value so that it can be called the story to guide our species. And there is no other story comparable to it. So to preserve and develop that story was one of the primary commitments of the ancient Gnostics who derived from the Magian order. And they saw that in 6 BC, that mission had come to a crucial turning point. Up until then, they had preserved the sacred narrative of the Aeon Sophia in their inner circles. And they had not told the story outwardly to the public. Why didn't they do that? It was not because they were holding something back. They were not control freaks who wanted to operate in secrecy and manipulate the masses. They withheld the story within their own circles because they knew that the story has to be handled skillfully. The narrative of this living earth from its origin, including the narrative of the origin of the human species and including the narrative of the alien intrusion upon earth, that's a big story and it has to be handled skillfully and carefully. So up until this moment, the Gnostics had observed not secrecy, but they had observed a vow of silence and they had not released 
the Sophianic narrative, which today is called the fallen goddess scenario, to the world at large. But they realized that they needed to do that. And additional to doing that, in the process of releasing it, they also had to do something else. They faced a really formidable challenge. Now this challenge continues to this day. And I have done my best with all the resources of my sanity and learning to meet this challenge. The challenge was to present to humanity an image of its own identity as a species. Now, as a matter of fact, according to the actual events of history that transpired, the Gnostics were not able to carry out that mission. The reason being that when Christianity rose to power, converts to Christianity, led by their ideologues, attacked the mysteries and the Gnostics. And they wiped them out. And they destroyed their writings and they destroyed the sanctuaries of the mystery school and the campuses of mystery schools that were located all around the Mediterranean basis from Eleusis to Alexandria. And so the Gnostics who committed themselves to bring to humanity an icon of its identity as a species were not able to fulfill their mission, not due to their own fault or failure, but due to the tremendous magnitude of the hateful and destructive forces directed against them. And what happened as a consequence of the destruction of the mysteries? Well, humanity received, and you have received it as well, a false and fraudulent image of the species identity. I call it the species self identity. You see you as an individual member of the human species have your own identity, don't you? Obviously, yes. But did it ever occur to you that the species to which you belong has an identity? It has its own self-image. But given that concept to consider, how would you visualize that self-image of the human species? How would you picture it? Well, that was the question facing the Gnostics of the time when they saw this signal in the sky. They knew that the moment had come for them to do that, but they were never allowed to complete that mission. And that turned out to be a great, great tragic misfortune for humanity in place of what the Gnostics would have provided as a genuine image of the species, something else came into play. And what is that? Well, obviously, you can guess, can't you? It's the image of Christ as the supreme example of humanity. That image is a terrible deceit that has been inflicted upon the human race all the races of the human species, to speak correctly, for the last 2,000 fucking years. And it has caused tremendous confusion, division, and harm. And it has, in fact, caused dementia in the human animal. It is demented to regard the figure of Christ behind which looms the figure of Melchizedek as the image of your humanity. 
and our humanity in its totality. So you can see what a serious, serious turn of events took place in 6 BC as the Gnostics observed this omen in the sky. And you can track that omen forward in 60 year intervals and bring it right up to recent historical events in recent time. I won't go into that whole song and dance right now, but I can tell you it is a fabulous learning experience. So to conclude, Star of Bethlehem is an anecdote in a Jewish fairy tale. But the story about the mission of the Magi is true. So consequently, those who adopted the Christian faith, as I said in Not in His Image, Christianity is a religion, a belief system embraced by millions but rarely chosen by anyone. So from that period onward, Christianity rose into power. It became a state religion in the fourth century and Christianity enforced the fraudulent image of the Messiah, the Jewish Christian Messiah. It's the same entity. And the Gnostics were driven out of their sanctuaries. They had to take refuge in the westernmost parts of Europe, in England and Wales and Ireland. And they did survive. But unfortunately, tragically, they were not able to accomplish their mission. I've written about this problem extensively in my book, not in its, his image, which, by the way, I'm revising right now, but there is a chapter in there where I describe exactly what the Gnostics were considering to present externally to the world at large, to the public, as a representation or icon of humanity. And their image was the shepherd of Hermas, and the shepherd of Hermas, which you can look up on the internet, is actually an image of a child, a 10-year-old child. that could be either a boy or a girl. And on the shoulders of that child, across the shoulders, is a lamb. So that is what the Gnostic initiates would have proposed as the image that you can contemplate in order to comprehend the identity of your species, of the species to which you belong, the anthropine species. By contrast to that, what has happened? People look at the cross or they look at the crucified man on the cross. The cross is a, a torture instrument so they look at a tortured man and they see in that the reflection of their own humanity. Hey, what could go wrong? That's a fair question. And the question that I would put to those millions around the world who revere that image as a sacred mirroring of who they are and what they are well, I would put to them this question. Hey, how's it working out for you? Enough said, and I'll be seeing you in the beauty to come.